I always encourage people like not to let art get in the way of the profession. And the real artist is really like what you can do operating within these guidelines. Welcome to Beyond the Lens presented by Diesel Films. I am Seth Shapiro. And I'm AJ Speaks. In this episode, we welcome Division I football player turned filmmaker, Micah Brown. Micah tells us about his determination that earned him a Division I football scholarship at the University of Kansas. He tells us about his year in Hollywood and then how a meeting with an ESPN executive motivated him to make his first documentary, Prison Fighters, for Showtime. Micah shares with us how he was able to get the intimidating Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz to be so forthcoming and vulnerable in his ESPN 30 for 30 doc called Chuck and Tito. But before that film even came to fruition, he walks us through the lunch meeting that changed his career forever. And you Jayhawk fans will want to relive the infamous fake punt catch in the Orange Bowl. Needless to say, that was not Beamer Ball's finest hour. We cover all that and much more on Beyond the Lens from Diesel Films. We have a good one today. The only director DP that I've worked with that played Division I football and also made a huge play in the Orange Bowl. We welcome Micah Brown to Beyond the Lens. Micah, what's happening? What's up, guys? How's it going? Thanks for having me. Of course. Pleasure to talk to you. So, Micah, we like to break this podcast up into three acts. The first act being your story. Where did you grow up and did you always have a knack for being creative? I grew up in a small town of 5,000, uh, Holdridge, Nebraska. So literally out in the middle of nowhere in a cornfield. And uh, my dad, he played at football at Nebraska. So I always had a passion for sports. Um, and my mom's side, my uncle, David Robichaux, was a uh, Emmy Award winning journalist for WBZ in Boston. And so he kind of got me interested in storytelling. Um, the documentary side was always something that was interesting to me, but I always wanted to be an actor. I wanted to make movies. And that kind of was what my passion was, running around with my friends, with a camera, making home movies. And I just knew that someday that this would be, storytelling would be a route that I wanted to go. So most times I would ask you what sports you grew up playing, but I'm going to ask you, what plays were you in? What plays was I in? Man, I was in uh, Footloose. I was in, uh, I was the Cowboy Willard in Footloose. It was a musical. And uh, let's see, I was in The Jungle Book. I was in another one called Honk. Uh, I actually won like best actor in high school for like one act plays and when it came time for me to transfer high schools, because um, we were going to Holdridge, and then I ended up transferring to Kearney High School, which is in Kearney, Nebraska, and that's where I went my sophomore through senior year. Uh, I made that decision because, not because they were a bigger school and they were the highest class in Nebraska, but because they did three plays a year. And my parents were like, are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah, man, like, this is what I want to do. And so... That was, I was the thespian guy. I was the <laughs> athlete. I was out there doing all this stuff. And it was always something that I was in a band, you know, in high school. Uh, we thought we were in Lincoln Park, uh, which, God, hilarious. And, you know, it was, it was just kind of a, you know, diverse background of skills. So let me ask you, there's always, or usually there's a teacher or there's someone influential that helps put you on that path. What was the teacher's name or how did they or who was it that helped influence you and get you to that path of being an actor, pursuing film? I know you mentioned your uncle, but was there a professor or a teacher or someone that sent you down that path? Yeah, absolutely. You know, my uncle kind of planted the seed. My parents kind of nurtured it by being supportive and always trying to use whatever connections they had or whoever they knew in their life uh, to be able to help me see that it was possible but then when I was out kind of looking around at schools, mainly for track, I was being recruited by the University of Kansas. And um, they took me and introduced me to a professor there in the film school named Kevin Wilmont. And um, Kevin Wilmont wrote, he was an, he's an Oscar winning screenwriter. He wrote The Black Klansman. And he hadn't done it at the time, but he was a guy who had done a lot of stuff with Spike Lee. He had done a bunch of different things. And he was someone that when I talked to him and I saw someone is teaching this, that's actually done it. And he said, you can come to my office hours whenever you want. If you come to school here and you're a film major, you can come here and I'll mentor you. 
And that was probably the worst thing that somebody could ever offer a kid like me because I was knocking on his door constantly (laughs) showing him scripts. I mean, I was in there. I was like the kid, you know, like I was there every second that I told me I could do it. So you're right. Hey, you gave me your email. You know what I mean? So and I still have a great relationship with Kevin. I texted him when he won his Oscar and I was so happy for him. And he's been a great mentor in my life to kind of guide my storytelling. Uh, sensibilities. Big shout out to Kevin. It's always cool to hear those stories about those people that are influential in your life. Yeah. Good segue as well. So you're running track at the University of Kansas and then you try out for the football team. Talk us through that. What was your thought process there? Man, you know, track was something that kind of came a lot easier to me. I definitely wasn't a world beater. I mean, track is a very, very, very hard sport. And there's fast people at Division One all the way down to JUCO, you know. And so um, I felt like it was it just came easier to me. And so it was a comfortable thing. And I felt myself getting a little bit complacent. You know, I got there on a scholarship. I'd gone through my first season and it wasn't quite the fun that I thought it was going to be, probably because I wasn't winning like I was in high school. But the other part was that I just didn't feel like um, for me, I wanted a different challenge. And I'd had a really good senior season and I committed early for track. And so I was like, man, I didn't really ever get to experience my max potential. So I went in and I said, hey, do you think that I can play? I would love to try out. And they said, listen, it's going to be a hard road. You know, in high school, I was a running back. They're like, we're going to try you at receiver, try it, you know, wherever we can fit you in. You're obviously very fast, but we promise that if you stick with it, you have a shot. And I said, all I want is a shot. And so I went out there and I walked on and uh, that first year was basically like a redshirt year for me, even though I'd already kind of had my redshirt years uh, doing track and it was a developmental year. And I took that as uh, I'm going to show them that I'm tough. I'm going to show them that I'm here to play and got scout team player of the year that year and worked really hard. And the next uh, three years after that, I saw the field and it was uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. Take me to the one place that you played. I think I have an answer where you're going to go with this, that you were just like in awe to to walk on that field, to play there, to be in that moment. Where was that? You know, to me, I mean, there's some big games that I was a part of. But for me, being a Nebraska kid, one of the most special places that I was able to go to was playing at the University of Nebraska. I got the opportunity to play there twice. We lost, unfortunately, both times, but we won both times when we were at home. And it was awesome. You know, my dad is somebody that I've always looked up to a lot, uh, not just athletically, but obviously he's my father and a huge mentor. And, you know, I think for years, I always kind of thought, I don't want to follow necessarily the same path as my dad because of these high expectations that, you know, he was a legendary Husker and he had done these different things. And then I think the more time that went along, I'm like, man, it's not a bad person to be compared to, (laughs) you know, and it was actually not bad to have those kind of expectations because, you know, if I could be a quarter of the man he is, that's an accomplishment. So to be able to step foot on the same field that I grew up going to, even though I was in a different uniform, uh, was pretty awesome for me. What was the moment like when you earned a football scholarship? Oh man, earning the scholarship, uh, I can tell you I was walking on campus and they called and they said, Coach Mangino wants to uh, talk to you. And I thought, oh, man, I'm either in trouble. So I'm certain searching my mind or something's good is about to happen. And when they made that announcement and, you know, the all my teammates are cheering and I'm in the meeting room, you've seen those kind of scholarship stories before on YouTube. And I can't tell you the flood of emotion that I felt because you truly when you earn it, and truly earn it, not like based on anything you did in high school, but what you did against your peers, you know, all of the time it takes and struggle it takes, it means something. And it felt like one of the greatest accomplishments that I've ever had in my life. And uh, I just knew that I had to do the rest of that season to prove that I they made the right decision. And I think it finished out my career pretty well. What was that conversation like when you called your parents to tell them that you had earned a scholarship? Oh, man, they're both crying. and You know, my my dad was so pumped just because they knew that I was willing when I went into it. I'm not like delusional like some of these other guys that are playing like I played on special teams and I got was a reserve reserve receiver. 
I wasn't going to the NFL. Like the guys who started ahead of me at receiver, they all went to the NFL. They all got drafted. The guys who were on defense and the other positions was Aqib Tlaib at corner. He's in the, he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> Chris Harris, corner. He's a Hall of Famer. Daryl Stuckey, he was a pro bowler, you know, at safety. So it was like I felt pretty good about seeing the field at all. You know, and so the fact that I was able to get a reward and they saw that I stuck with it even though I had I was a role player, uh, they were just really proud of that. 2008, your senior year, Kansas goes 12-1, and one, led by quarterback Todd Reesing, and goes to the Orange Bowl to play Virginia Tech. Obviously a great season for the Jayhawks, but late in the third, fourth and 10, up 17-14. Oh, Ball close to the 50. Tell us what happens. Well, you know, this is like I have a reoccurring nightmare of this play, and I will get to that later. But uh, it's fourth and 10. You know, they had just returned to punt for a touchdown, so they had all the momentum. We had the lead, but they were coming back, and they were coming back in a mighty way. And we went over to the sideline, and, and uh, they said, hey, fake alert is on. And so I'm like, great. Now, what people don't know about the fake alert is that the fake never went to my side. They only went to the other side. And that was a blocking scheme, and they just that's the way that we'd always drawn it up. Well, I'm out there. I'm playing gunner on the left side of the punt team, and my guy disappears. He runs in to block the punt. So the rules are, if you see your guy leave, wait until somebody calls you in so they don't snap the ball and you're off sides. So I'm screaming in at our up back. His name is uh, B Mac. I was like, B Mac, it's Brandon McAnderson. I'm like, you know, bring me in. <laughs> and uh, they see that the return man slid over to the guy that we normally throw it to. And all of a sudden they snap the ball. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening right now. <laughs> and then I see a ball come flying out of the pack of people and it's wobbly. And I'm kind of jogging off the line. I got to stop. I come back catch it off the blades of grass. Still don't know what's happening. I don't know if I just caught a punted ball. I have no idea what happened. I turn, turn it upfield, get the first down. Uh, you know, some people think I should have cut back. I kind of was like, listen, count my blessings. I caught it. Let's just get out of this play. So go through that. And everybody's like, oh, my God, this is one of the biggest plays in the Orange Bowl. You might have just saved us the game. And uh, it all happened from a – from uh, Brandon McAnderson just drawing a play in the sand, deciding on his own that he was going to throw it out to me. And now it's uh, one of the you know most famous plays in KU history. And my only reception of my career that they had ever thrown me the ball or even looked my way. Normally it's like, hey, get in there and block that guy. Hey, good <laughs> job. All right, get the guy, get the real players back in here. You know, but it's a pretty good way to be remembered. I'll tell you what, I'm I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. So the Hokies and all my friends listening right now are mad that about that play because they remember it. But Beamer <laughs> was known for special teams. And the reaction to him after that play is classic. Oh, oh. he's throwing his helmet down. I mean, it is it is, it is oh. a memorable moment. And it was something that I'll never forget. Beamer was just so pissed. <laughs> it was a great reaction. He's a weird dude. He, he used to wear masks and, and costumes around campus so people wouldn't recognize him. So, uh, you know, he got what he deserved. You beat him on that one. <laughs> After a great Orange Bowl victory, you, you graduate Kansas. Uh, tell us what, what happens next. So after I graduated, um, I decided I wanted to kind of pursue – you know, it's funny. It's like when you get done with school, especially if you go to film school, they're like, great, go do film. And you're like, oh, do film? Like what part? Like there's a thousand different areas and I have no experience, you know, because what I made a short film, I'm going to send that to somebody. They're going to be like, great, thanks, kid. You know, so I think the um, initial thing was I went back and talked to my uncle and he knew some people in the trailer business. And he said, hey, you know, maybe you should try to pursue movie trailers. I'm like, that sounds fun. So I flew out to L.A., and I uh, started working at a company called The Refinery Creative. Initially, it started out where I was just delivering wine and you know doing all that stuff for somebody. And they said, you'll probably be in this job for a couple of years. And I said, a couple of years? Are you crazy? <laughs> you know, I said, uh, I had a little different mindset than I think a lot of people out there where you kind of go like, 
you're an assistant for five years. Then you're somebody's like, I don't know, coat guy for another 10 years, you know, and then you're eventually going to be like an assistant camera operator, you know, or whatever. And so my approach was like, Hey, I will do this. I will do whatever I'm hired to do, but just, can I work on trailers on my own time? Cause I want to be an editor if I'm working at a trailer house. They said, yeah. And I ended up working like a hundred hours a week. They had to like, give me a key. I was there. I was there till three in the morning. I'd get in at six, you know, I'd go in there and I'd just work and I'd just be like, just promise me you'll give me feedback. Within two months, I got promoted several times and I uh, was working on trailers for a um, bunch of different movies and working as an editor. And so I kind of climbed up from that post background and it taught me a lot, it taught me a lot about uh, when you only have like 10 jokes, but you got to do like 50 versions of something, you got to just keep working through it, you know, and um, that helped me a lot in documentary. Now, when I look at it, because sometimes you only get these shots and that's what you got to work with. So how are you going to make your vision happen? Because it's not an answer like, well, give me better stuff. You know, eventually you just got to make something cool and put your stamp on it. So started there. Moved into kind of working full time, moved back to Kansas, started working full time for KU. And um, that's when I really started getting into more shooting and documentary storytelling. So then tell us, Michael, when did your in your mind, when did you get your big break? Man, I think my big break, honestly, like that first job that I had at Kansas where I was kind of doing I was doing a documentary series following the team through the season. And I had never shot. I had never picked up a camera before in my life. And so suddenly I'm having to learn how to shoot on this DSLR and doing all of that stuff. I'm learning about, because I wanted to put a show together. I wanted to make like a college version of Hard Knocks. That was my vision. Nobody was really doing that at the time. A couple of years of that went by and it taught me a lot about storytelling. And when I decided to start my own business after two years of working at Kansas, I got kind of discovered by ESPN. And that was my big break. I was a sh on a show called Draft Academy, and it was following some guys up to and through the draft. And they basically dropped me in, you know, with one of the guys, Pierre Desir, and they said, you're following him. And I was with a producer who had a little bit of experience, and we were all kind of like trying to figure it out. And when you look at like everybody that came from that show, uh, Kristen Lapis, who's now like working at ESPN Film, she's like a multiple Emmy Award winning uh, producer. Jason Johnson, Jose Morales, like there's so many different producers that have like come out of this thing because we all just kind of dropped in and decided we were gonna uh, figure it out together. From D1 football player to ESPN and other networks, I think, you know, you've proven that the athlete's mentality has really shown up in your career. But we're going to enter into the second act right now. We're going to focus on your 30 for 30 film, Chuck and Tito, a UFC rise and fall, where Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz were the face of the renaissance of the UFC until they met father time. How did this doc come together and how did you get involved with it? Man, you know, this one was a crazy, this is one of those rare experiences where you pitch something and they green light it like immediately. And it came together because Jose Morales and I uh, were talking, you know, about trying to do a long form project together. ESPN had just signed a big deal with the UFC and I knew that they would be looking for a project uh, about UFC fighters. My brother-in-law is Phil Murphy, who works at ESPN, who does a ton of UFC stuff. And so I hit up Phil and I said, hey, Phil, do you know Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz? I think that they're having a third fight. I think it would be amazing to be able to tell the story of their careers since they kind of are the godfathers of what brought the UFC to the mainstream through their stories. You know, what do you think? Do you think you could get a hold of them? He said, well, you know, I don't know their managers personally, but Brett Okamoto does. And so they hit up Brett Okamoto, who's one of the main personalities at ESPN covering the UFC. And he texted us right back and was like, they're both in. I'm like, what? Is that easy? <laughs> you know, that never happens. Normally we got to have 20 calls with agents and stuff. So then, you know, I'd been talking and built a strong relationship with ESPN and some people at ESPN Films for years and we'd always been trying to find a project to do together. And so we set up a call. They're like, this sounds great. And I'm like, what? Is this like real life? You know what I mean? 
And they're like, give us a budget. We'll, we're like, well, we got to start tomorrow. Sounds good. You know? And so he's like, wait a minute. This wow. can't be true. You know? And so. Um, it's that easy to do a 30 for 30. It's that easy. Yeah, it's that easy, guys. You know, any idea just happens. We're the first people to ever think about a Chuck Liddell 30 for 30. You know, I'm sure it was the only pitch that they ever got, you know? So, um, yeah, it was awesome. So we were able to kind of get things going and, uh, you know, start shooting immediately. They were going to fight a third time. And so we had this kind of like natural, you know, drop in, see where they're doing now, kind of book into the story. And then it was about me educating myself about the UFC. That was kind of like a big thing that I had to do. Obviously, I'm a storyteller, but was I an expert? No. You know, and so I had to start really digging in to figure out how exactly all this stuff would come together. It's interesting because I feel like you started at the end because you knew you had that third fight. So that's where you knew you would end. Right. But then you decided to go back to the beginning and figure out how to weave that whole story together. And for me, I'm not a UFC fan. So when I watched your documentary, I felt like it did a great job of like, okay, I didn't know where any of this stuff. So it was great. Was that part of your whole storytelling process? Cause you had to go through it yourself. Yeah, man. You know, I think what it is, is that um, one of the things that I like to do with my films is I want to introduce the everyday person who's not a fan of any of it. Like I wasn't a fan of like, I didn't know anything about Muay Thai or Thailand or prison in my first doc, you know, but what I want to do with my movies is I want anyone to be able to sit down and watch it. You don't have to be like an insider to be able to enjoy it. And so for me, that was kind of like, that's where the human elements come out. That's where kind of like the entertainment factor comes in. And you want to be able to satisfy the diehards and not tell them stuff they already know. But you also want to be able to tell somebody that doesn't know anything about it. And so I think it did play to our advantage to be able to, that I was kind of discovering things myself, but then surrounding myself with people like Brett and like Phil that were like, yeah, man, this is kind of how people think about it. And here are some people that you need to talk to. And then doing your own research and just going from there. Now it makes sense because I, I went back and watched your fight, your, your other documentary, Prison Fighters, and you did the same thing. I didn't know anything about Muay Thai either. And I'm like, so that becomes sort of like your signature. You like to explain and teach all the way through. Yeah, my, my signature that I would say is that I enjoy in an ideal situation for long form is that I would have two storylines that kind of run parallel with each other and then they intersect. You know, and so I kind of like that in prison fighters, you had the story of the fighter who's in prison, who's trying to get out. And then you had a pr guy who is out of prison and you're kind of uh, following his journey of like what it's like on the outside. And in some ways it gives you a like longer path to be able to see that maybe the guy who's in prison becomes like this, like this is what his destiny is going to be, you know, and so they intersect in that type of way to where you can actually kind of see a little bit broader look at who that person is. And with mm -hmm. Chuck and Tito, you know, we had, we had five storylines in that film. Like that was a hard movie to make. We had the history of the UFC. We had Chuck, we had Tito, we had Dana in his whole storyline. And then we had a third fight, you know? So that was why for me, I like things to move quick. I want it to feel almost like you're going into different pods and you're like living here, living there, and it moves a little bit more like a movie or like a video game so that you're not just sitting there watching, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I think that that's kind of the balance of being able to have numerous things going on at once. I love how you set up the history of the UFC into the you know sale to Dana White and the Fertitta brothers. I thought you did a fantastic job with that. But I wanted to ask you, how did you gain the trust of Tito and Chuck uh, to tell their story? Because we know trust is an ultimate factor in making a documentary. Well, apparently if you just text them, they're like, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. No, um, you know, honestly, like a lot of it, once I had a chance to talk to them, I talked to them both on the phone before we like, you know, you get the initial, yeah, I'm interested, but then you talk to them. And, and for me, the most important thing, whenever I work with anybody, it's building that relationship and, and stating your intentions. You know, so for me, when I talk to him, I say, hey, look, this is the way that I see your story, but it's how I see your story right now. And I want to know from you and I want to be transparent with you about the whole process. And so I would call them and I would say, hey, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but this, 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 is this how you felt about this? And I would let him be involved. Even though Tito ended up kind of blasting some parts of the film after it came out, he was like angry about how he was representing some things that Dana had said. Tito understood that like, listen, Micah did everything that he said he was going to do. And at some point, you can't make a movie that everybody's happy with. Like you can hold your word, which is what I did, which is saying, hey, this is how I'm going to do it. And this is how I'm going to approach it. And this is where this thing is trending towards. But we're not making propaganda for an individual person. And so I think people appreciate it. If you are able to say, I'm going to take a very balanced look at it. I'm going to keep you informed on how the story is progressing. And I'm not just going to surprise you at the end with a final cut. You're going to know, and I'm going to actually clear it with you. So even if they do disagree with some of the things of how they are, they understand. And I think that it resonates with people and that reputation kind of helps build trust. One of the things we've learned is that the name was always usually a working name. Did, did you know right off the top, this is what we're going to call this doc, or did it evolve into that? No, man, I would never have called the documentary Chuck and Tito if that if I could come up with something better. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think uh, I think that was kind of like the obvious name that ultimately ESPN felt good about because you want to have the characters' names in it. I'm not really like good at coming up with names. It's kind of funny, like Prison Fighters, Five Rounds to Freedom. I didn't even know that was the title of my movie until I saw the trailer. I was get like, yeah. I thought it was I thought it was either prison fighters. Actually, it was called Freedom Fighters, as far as I knew. And then uh, we had thrown out a couple ideas, and I think maybe they couldn't decide, so they just put them together. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. That's what my movie's called, you know what I mean? But it was all good. You know, to me, it's like about the movie. The rest of the stuff is like marketing. So I'm like, whatever. However, you, what do you mean you call it to like, you can make it called Chuck Liddell's Spin Kick or Mohawk. I don't care. Make sure people watch it. You know, I wanted to ask you about Tito Ortiz and Dana White. Yeah. If they happen to run into each other walking down the street, what do you think would happen? Dana was eviscerating him in the interview. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, he got destroyed for sure. The fight world is weird, right? Like, I think everybody hates each other and then they're cool with each other at different times. And so I think we're just kind of conditioned to think that it's like this real hate all the time. And I think there's a mutual respect for what they had been able to build in a company. Would they like go hang out voluntarily? No. If they see each other at an event, would they shake hands and say, what's up? I'm sure they would. And so I think that's just kind of how it is. I mean, I think everybody kind of has these feuds and you're dealing with a lot of people that are tough guys and a lot of people that are, have to have tough skin in the fight world. And Tito and Dana are both alpha males who definitely have a history with each other, but they're also pros. Like, I think that, I think they're fine. Did you have any stories that hit the cutting room floor that you wanted to include? Oh my God, so many. So many good ones. There Give us a go. A, oh, man. There's a really good one. Um, this one actually was kind of featured. I think they they made like a specials features thing in between the previews. But at the time, Dana White was Chuck's manager before he was the president of the UFC. And so when Chuck was like first going around and doing all these fights, him and Chuck or Dana and Chuck are just like touring the countryside, you know, like doing these fights. And uh, Dana's his manager. And he goes in and he checked into this uh, hotel, I believe it was in New York. And all of a sudden the bellman comes out and he goes, I could kick that guy's ass. He tells Dana this about Chuck, that he could beat up Chuck Liddell. He's like, I bet you, I, I think it was like 500 bucks that I could beat up Chuck Liddell. And so Dana's like, oh yeah, you think so? So he goes up and gets Chuck out of his room. Chuck comes down into the living room and he wrestles this guy in the middle of the hotel <laughs> lobby. And so Chuck oh throws him God. on the ground. And he's got him, the guy taps. It's like, ah! And then he's like, all right, double or nothing. And Chuck's like, what? You know, so he grabs the guy again. I guess he like throws him on the ground, puts him in a crucifix. And the guy's screaming, my neck, my neck, my neck. <laughs> and so Dana said he just threw him 500 bucks and they got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are just straight animals. They'll oh, man. Anywhere. I mean, like, why? Look at Chuck. 
Well, especially back then, though, they were still they weren't making all that money. So, like, hey, you gonna offer it a fight? You gonna take your money? Listen, man, like, dude, anybody tries to kick me in a fight, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> like anyone, I don't care how big you are, even if you're a little guy, if that's like your thing. All of a sudden, you're like, oh yeah, you're at a bar, somebody's supposed to drink on you, and it's like a push, and then a guy kicks you. You're like, I'm out. <laughs> Not unless it's a kick, unless it's a kick in the shins, then you can. You can uh, dude, I wouldn't take. I couldn't take a kick in the shin. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'd be like, I'm in some trouble right now. I thought the home security cameras at Tito's house of Jenna Jameson drinking while she was pregnant, and then also breaking the cameras was very interesting. How did you access that footage? Mm, I don't know that I'm at liberty to say who gave us that footage. Or how we got that footage, but we got it. It's on YouTube too. So, um, but we did have to have some permissions. We need to know. We need to know. This is beyond the <laughs> I lens. Can't I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I'm gonna take you to another moment that I thought was powerful because I agree with Seth. I thought that that was just great access and, and great footage. But Chuck Liddell's interview when he was talking about his father and he got emotional. Yeah. Can you take us into that moment and and what you're telling yourself, like? You know, we know count the six and all that, but what are you what are you thinking? And as this is building, and he's sort of starting to get that rage, and he's telling you that story. Man, that was like one of the more powerful things. So, prior to his interview, I had a long conversation with he and his wife. I said, you know, I know you guys have done a lot of media stuff. I know you've probably told these stories a thousand times, and we can do those kind of interviews. But if you want to make something really special, you got to be vulnerable. I said, the difference between transparency and vulnerability is that transparency just answers questions when asked. Vulnerability is when you offer things without being asked. And we need you to be vulnerable if you're willing to be vulnerable in order to make this film great. So he was. And we were only like, man, I want to say we were like 15 minutes into his six and a half hour master interview. Wow. Wow. Six and a half hours, bro. It was like a it was like a full blown uh, torture chamber of questioning. <laughs> That's a lot of sound, <laughs> and we'll get to that. And I'll, and there's a reason why I wanted it to be like that, and we'll get to that. But when when Chuck started telling that story, and he was getting so emotional, and I mean, this is a guy who's like known as like the Ice Man. He doesn't get rattled by anything. Yeah. It was powerful, man. I started getting teared up. He could barely even put sentences together of the emotion that he was feeling. And you knew that it was just something deep that he had never talked about. And he said, I'd never talked about my dad before, but I think that that personal connection and the prep work that we kind of did before it. And just knowing that my heart wasn't just to go get a dollar off his name, but instead to really tell his story and the platform of a 30 for 30 helped him be willing to go there. And I think that it really helped explain who he was and how he became the fighter that he is. Well done, man. That, that, that's, that's transparency and vulnerability. That's, that's powerful. That's actually a good way to phrase it. Yeah. Well, thanks. The six-hour interview, the reason that we wanted to do them, and Tito's was just as long, by the way. And the reason that I did that um, is probably just like a visual optics thing for me. Um, I drives me insane when I watch a documentary and there's like four interview looks for the master interviews. It just does. I don't know why it just drives me crazy because I know how the editing process is. Like you take a line over here and then you take a line over here and then you put it, you know, it's not always like, doesn't always work out like that. Like how you have your questions sorted. So I wanted to try to cover everything and you just never know what's going to happen. You may never get these guys again. So Chuck, we took some breaks and he would get up, he'd walk around, we had food there, we'd sit down, we'd go for another hour, walk around. Tito, he was like, ask five questions, you're there for six hours, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it was good, you know? And he had some really crazy stuff too that he had been through in his life and it becomes a therapeutic thing. And some people enjoy it and some people hate it, but I think if they allow themselves to use it as an opportunity 
to tell their, their story instead of just an obligation that they have for media to check off their list, then I think that when they use it as an opportunity, they, they actually enjoy it because it's more therapeutic than they realize. That's really great insight into how to get authentic, transparent, you know, vulnerable interviews. I mean, what you did there was just incredible. The third fight was promoted by Golden Boy, Oscar De La Hoya. ESPN obviously has a deal with the UFC. Uh, was there any tension around shooting that third fight or anything going on there with the sort of triangle? No, the UFC wasn't involved in this. So they didn't really care, you know, that what we were doing. ESPN and Golden Boy weren't, you know, they, that wasn't a conflict. Golden Boy, you know, I think they were trying to figure out what they were trying to do. And so I think that was a little bit of a challenge just from us. But no, I mean, I don't think there was any complications or beef between that. You know, I think that Dana understood that these guys were not UFC fighters anymore. And so whatever they chose to do, he wished them the best. If they were going to make the money that they hoped that they would make, then Dana would have been happy for him. Um, but clearly it didn't pan out that way. And I think that if anything, it showed that the UFC is pretty elite when it comes to uh, promoting and uh, MMA events. Now you waited until closer to the end of the film to introduce Chuck's wife. Uh, why did you, why did you choose to make that decision and introduce her at the end? Initially, what I wanted to do was to weave in and out of more of the modern day stuff of the process of them training and kind of like find a way to make it half follow doc, half like historical doc. And then our deadline got moved up significantly. And so we were like, well, the path of least resistance is probably just to make this a linear story. And so a lot of the stuff that we shot, probably like 95% of the stuff that we shot, followed Doc. I mean, we followed them for pretty much the whole training camp, you know, oh, wow. leading up to it. And that footage wow. just, just turned into a montage at the end. You know, so we have a ton of footage. Sometimes, you know, Kevin Wilmont once said, sometimes you got to be willing to kill your babies. I hear a lot of filmmakers that are always like, don't compromise your vision. Never compromise your vision. And I would say those are the broke guys on Vimeo. You know, honestly, because <laughs> if you want to, if you want to be a uh, professional filmmaker, it's not about being the most creative. It's about being the most creative on command. And sometimes a big wrench gets thrown into your pot and you're like, man, what am I going to do here? And you're like, well, vision aside, what is the best film that I can make right now? And that was the movie that we came out with. And I'm actually really happy that it did. And I think that it just, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of, I guess, humility in some ways. It sounds weird to say like, I was so humble in this moment, but, but honestly it does, <laughs> you know, it takes, it takes humility to be like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to lay this down because I think that the film is bigger than me and the film would be better served if it was told like this. And I think that that's the reason that we had to do that. I think you struck the right chord because to be honest with you, I didn't care about their third fight. Like I wouldn't have been yeah. into that, but, but the fact, the way that you did it and we talked about earlier, like just the linear part of it, it just made perfect sense. And, you know, for our listeners who haven't watched it, I highly recommend watching it because it does take you from the beginning all the way up until I didn't even know there was a third fight. Like the way you did it, you introduced it so late and I'm like, Oh, he already did the interview. I'm like, Oh, okay. And sort of just following along with it, but it, it was well done. Oh, yeah. Thanks. We yeah, I appreciate Sarah, that. Yeah, we had Sarah Moshman on the show and she said, if you make the film that you set out to make, then you did it wrong. So I think this oh. is a great example of, of that. Yeah, dude, there's a movie you write, a movie you shoot, a movie you edit. And hopefully the movie you edit is a fraction is as close to the movie that you wrote at the beginning. You know, I think that's hey, just well, always the case. If it was an epic five round fight, in the trilogy, then then you'd have your you change part it. two. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you'd have your exactly. part, or you'd have your part two. Exactly. Golden Boy would still be doing UFC. Would yeah, still exactly. be doing mixed martial arts. A hundred percent though, yeah. Seth, because you, you take all that footage, because that's like a 24-7, right? You're you're doing yeah. all that, you're building it up, and then it's like, okay, but the fight was a whatever. So like who cares? Exactly. Yeah. That happened to us with Mayweather Pacquiao. Uh, I was helping my brother document Pacquiao. 
on the road to the Mayweather fight, and the fight was such a dud that Top Rank just killed all the footage. I wanted to ask you, were there any crazy moments uh, with Chuck or Tito during the filming of the documentary? I think the craziest thing is just to see how big a star these guys really are. When you're with Chuck Liddell and you're in Vegas and you literally can't walk anywhere without someone coming out of nowhere and being like, Ice Man, let me get a picture with you. Like literally, it, you just don't really know what that would be like. You know, when you're, when you're that, when you are Chuck Liddell and you're the baddest man in the world, and everyone knows you, and then all of a sudden you lose, and you're not that guy anymore, man, it's crazy. And I think that that's what I kind of walked away with is like, wow, you know, a lot of people want to talk about, well, why can't these fighters like go do something else? And like, it's their own fault that they you know, spend all their money or doing whatever, you know, and, and people try to talk about the adjustment that athletes have to make once they're done being a competitor and moving into normal life. That would be hard. Nobody claps for you when you get a promotion. And I don't think anyone cares that Chuck was knocked out, you know, three or four times at the end of his career. When you see the Iceman, Chuck Liddell, you're still like, I'm scared of that dude. <laughs> I mean, he's a yeah. bad boy. I mean, we don't care. But imagine if it was you. Like, I still go out there in a basketball hoop and jump up there. And I'm like, damn, I barely touched the net. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're not as bad as you used to be. Yeah, you know, and you got this guy and he knows like that would take every knockout takes a blow to your identity a little bit. I'll tell you, you what. I so I think that was something that was pretty crazy. I, I didn't realize that those guys lost so many times and it's accepted to just keep coming back. Like, again, I'm not a UFC fan. So I'm like, man, these dudes, they got whooped. Like how many times do they get to keep coming back? But that was a cool part of the story is like they did. And then, hey, here he comes again. And it's like Tito's back again. I'm like, man, these dudes lost the last time we saw it but i guess that's just the nature of the sport yeah it's a different mindset for sure it's like a different construct too i think that fighting is so primal when we think about any other sport like i don't know football or basketball if you'd be like bro you can't hit that jumper you've bricked the last like 87 shots that you've tried to take you're done yeah. you know whereas fighting is really who they are it really is who they are. So it strikes a different chord. It's like they like just testing themselves. And unless you're going to go to prison, how else are you going to test yourself in that type of way? And so I think that it's really extra hard for these guys to walk away from fighting because it does something to you when you know that you could beat anybody. You know that that's the life that you've made for yourself doing this. And then suddenly, what are you going to do? Go bag groceries somewhere? You know, you're just never going to get that. One of my favorite movies is The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke. Oh, yeah. Directed by Darren Aronofsky. And this remind, this documentary reminded me of The Wrestler. Kind of a sad ending. Oh, thanks, man. That was something that, yeah, it was for sure. You know, I mean, it's sad yeah. in that when should somebody give it up? sad to see a champ go on the way out. Chuck would even say, don't feel sorry for me. This is what I've chosen. You know, this is the life that I've chosen. I'm having, I'm the most alive when I'm in here fighting, even if I'm losing. And for us, it's like, oh my God, we can never like get that because we're not fighters. But if you talk to any fighter, you know, top to bottom, they all say the same thing. Don't feel bad for us. We're choosing it. We want to get in there and do it. And losing is a part of it. And it just seems like so countercultural to what we would experience. I mean, I'm not going out. Unless I know I'm beating up Seth, I'm definitely not going to fight <laughs> Seth. You know what I mean? Hey, like, Seth. Gotta, that's not a good example. That's not no, a good no, example. Seth, you just got to kick him. He already told us. Just start off with a kick and you're good. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is, bro. <laughs> hey. Micah might have walked on to the Kansas football team, but he's still a big dude and a <laughs> Division One football player. <laughs> He's no joke. I wanted to ask you, what did it mean to you to, to direct a 30 for 30 and be a part of that family? It is, you know, is big, one of the biggest honors of my career for sure. When I got into this, when I was trying to decide whether I should start my own company or not, I actually cold called John Dahl at ESPN Films. And I heard that he was the guy to talk to. And so I literally got his number at his office and I called and he was impressed. And he talked to me surprisingly for like 15 minutes. And he said, why don't you come to New York and meet with me? 
talk about some of your ideas and I would just love to get to know you better. So I said, great. So I flew to New York, went and sat with him, pitched a couple ideas and I showed him my reel and I said, what do you think? You know, I had just like won a couple regional Emmys. So I thought I was like the man, you know? And he said, you know what? You need to work on your storytelling. I'm like, oh, that hurts. And I said, well, what do I got to do? I'm like, I can't really uh, tell those type of stories because I work for a school and I do this stuff. And he goes, well, and he's eating his salad while he's talking to me. And he says, well, sounds like you probably shouldn't work there anymore. And he just keeps <laughs> eating. And I mean, I'm like, wow. Right? Yeah. So memorable I moments. Taking it and got, been butthurt. Yeah. I could have been butthurt and just been like, fine, whatever, John. Eh, you know. But I'm instead, show you. Yeah. I went back and yeah. quit my job. I quit my job. And I said, you're right. And I found a passion project that I was going to do, whether a network paid me or not, which turned out to be prison fighters. I flew <laughs> to Thailand on my own dime, got that project going, sold it to Showtime, and we're off and running. And I think that for me, the pinnacle was always a 30 for 30. And it's still, in my opinion, is still the biggest brand that you could possibly have in sports documentaries. And so to be able to say that I was a part of one is a huge, huge honor. That's a great story. And, and just want to, you know, show your courage to be able to listen and say, all right, I'm going to just stop and, you know, go off on my own. I have a question, though, about 30 for 30. We always hear about the notes uh, that you get back on your doc. Did you get a ton of notes? Did you have to make a lot of changes or were you able to tell a lot of the story that you wanted to tell? The notes from ESPN Films are great. They're actually very good storytellers probably the best storytellers that I've ever um, collaborated with. You know, when it comes to their notes, there are really no dumb notes. There were some notes that came from like, whether it's the UFC or different people that you def you definitely like don't always agree with, but even the UFC, you know, their notes, you totally understand. And you're going to have notes like that's a part of it. But I think that when it's bad notes, when it's like, I don't get this, you know, or like whatever. And it's just somebody trying to flex. There was none of that. Like there was definitely none of that. And they definitely empowered me as a filmmaker to do my thing. And they said over and over and over, we're with you. And they were. They never, ever had, I never had an issue with it at all. Like I was, it was a very enjoyable experience. They all were very qualified. It was really fun. I would do it again in a heartbeat. So, so to say Dana White could have come in and flexed and said, hey, I want you to do this or do that, but he didn't. No, I'm not saying that. I mean, I think that they definitely, you know, had some notes for sure. Dana did, but but ESPN Films, their notes were not like that at all. The UFC's input, like you got to consider, like when they're chiming in on notes, they got their own brand, and they're no different than like the NFL or the NBA or whoever. Like they all got to make sure that their interest is, you know, met. And so I think that that's just a part of it. If you want to play the game at a 30 for 30 level, or if you want to do a major doc and you can't handle those notes, get out of the game because it's a part of it. And especially if you're in the sports world, like people will be like, ah, I wish they would have done this with the last dance. Like, you kidding me? You think that Michael Jordan's not going to get notes? You know what I mean? So you got to just be a realist. And I think that that's kind of the harsh reality that if you want to play in this game, there are certain rules to the game and you make it within that space. And so I always encourage people like not to let art get in the way of the profession. And the real artist is really like what you can do operating within these guidelines. Great advice right there from Micah Brown. And we're going to get into act three, some quick hitters. For someone who wants to be the next Micah Brown, what advice would you give them? Uh, learn a skill. Learn a skill as far as um, shooting or editing. I think everybody wants to be in charge. So I think everybody wants to be a director. But I think in order to climb that ladder, you have to start with having a craft skill. And I think that my ability to shoot and edit has allowed me to have a real career in this space because I still take DP jobs. I still take just editing jobs. And it's great to be have your projects that you're in charge of, that you get to see all the way through. But to have those skills is something that 
will help you even when you're doing your own storytelling because you can communicate to people. And when you get a budget crunch and you need somebody to go DP it and you don't have $5,000, it really helps you to be able to go out and be able to do it yourself. How do you find your next story or how do you, do you have a list of, Hey, these are some stories and you keep them on file. How do you go about that process of knowing which stories you want to tell next? Man, that's a great question. You know, I think that it, it varies from time to time. You know, I think at different parts of your career, sometimes it changes. I think for me, the first thing that I start with is I start looking at themes that I'm interested in because I think those themes, no matter what the story is, end up being the thing that keep you interested in the project as they go over a year because you are going to hate the project that you pitched after like four months. And that's just the reality of doing a long form. Like you could be like, man, I got this amazing story about a prison in Thailand that allows inmates to fight for their freedom. And I was made to make this. And then like four years later, you're like, I don't understand Thai. I've been listening to this nonstop. Like I've been looking at the same shots. Like I can't handle this anymore. But when that story is about forgiveness and that story is about this idea of who deserves it, that kind of gives you a bigger reason to keep going on the story because it feels like it matters. Or if you're doing Chuck and Tito, you might get bored listening to Chuck and Tito six hour interviews, but you go, this story is really about identity and it's about, you know, this other stuff. And that's what kind of keeps you going. So I start there. I start by going, what is resonating with my spirit right now? What is something that I feel like is important for people to know? And then you just kind of start digging around. I start like looking up online, talking to different people, watching different things. And uh, the best stories usually come to you. You don't normally discover them. But sometimes if you can find a bigger meaning in even the most trivial stories, it can help. As a DP, red or airy? I'm a red guy. I, that's just because that's the camera I bought, not because I like love it so much more. I feel like that's just the camera that I prefer because that's the camera that I've shot the most with and i think there's a little weird feud that goes back and forth of like yeah, oh you shoot on red <laughs> why well, shoot on airy and then the red guys are like yeah but yours only shoots in 4k well it's not yo know, yours actually and then you just kind of go back and forth so ultimately i don't think it matters what gear you have if you can shoot you can shoot and there's been a lot of emmys that have been won on 5ds and you know i think that it's really just up to you and the kind of story that you're trying to tell Filmmaker you'd like to have dinner with? Oh, Chris Nolan, man. Who wouldn't want to have dinner with that guy? <laughs> Chris Nolan's the man. People give him a lot of hate for like his storytelling, but I feel like his concepts are really good. And I feel like uh, I enjoy those. I, I also think Charlie Kaufman is a genius. He's a writer. He wrote Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. He seems like a really weird person, too. And so I probably would enjoy just hanging out with him. <laughs> Who would you like to hear on this podcast? Get Eric Newman on there. He'd, he'd be good. Eric Newman. He'd be funny. Okay. Another guy that you should talk to, Jason Johnson. Get Jason Johnson on there. He's a former college player. He kind of came up with me in the draft academy. He's won numerous Emmys. He does a bunch of sports stuff. Former college quarterback at Arizona. He's a DP. You know, he, we're cut from the same cloth as far as our backgrounds. He's, he's a hilarious guy, so it'd be a good interview. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Michael, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. And uh, I've enjoyed all your documentaries. I look forward to whatever you're working on next because, uh, you know, Prison Fighters I wasn't familiar with. Uh, Tito and Chuck I had not watched. So, but diving into it for this conversation, I'm glad I watched it. And so well done. And I look forward to whatever you have come next. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you making time for me and uh, for this great conversation. We need to do it more. Micah, thank you for your time. Everyone, go check out Chuck and Tito on ESPN Plus and Prison Fighters on Showtime platforms. And we are wrapped. A special thanks to Micah Brown for breaking down his 30 for 30, Chuck and Tito, and giving us inspiration to make our own documentary. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you do, we'll give you a big shout out or even bring you on. If you liked what you heard, please share with your friends. We'll be back next week with another great episode of Beyond the Lens. And that's a wrap. And I'd like to give a special thanks to our editors, Jacob Gornberg and Andrew Holman, and our production assistant, Candace Evans.